survey shows that college students are largely illiterate when it comes to civics and American history. To be fair, college illiteracy is by no means limited to civics and history. I'm Dr. Duke, and she's Katie, and this is The Dr. Duke Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Dr. Duke Show, the only program that keeps you educated on the craziness impacting K-12 classrooms and college campuses around the world. Today, we're looking at a new college survey that finds only 8% of Democrat students are proud to be Americans. Plus, a black security guard at a Wisconsin high school is fired after an unruly black student called him the N-word 15 times. The security guard simply told him to stop using the N-word by using the N-word, and guess who got in trouble? But we start with a survey that finds college graduates know nothing about civics and American history. This should surprise absolutely no one. In fact, the whole country, the only people who know anything about American civic and civics and history are immigrants who actually have to take the test to become Americans. Well, that is pretty accurate as I taught U.S. history and civics, and I'm a fan of that. And yet no one else around me when I talk to him about it seems to be interested. So I just talk to the mirror on my own. But a recent national survey showed this basic lack of knowledge and had just perfect examples. Basically, the number of respondents, they didn't know who the current Supreme Court Chief Justice was, and they thought that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the quote-unquote representative in New York, is the one who authored the New Deal instead of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Yep, conducted by the American Council of Trustees and Alumni, quote, America's Knowledge Crisis, a survey on civic literacy, this was the survey, found huge shortfalls in Americans' knowledge of history or how their country operates. The survey polled 1,002 people, 61% of whom received or were receiving a college education. So that's, we're talking over 600 students in college on various civics questions. And that's what really gets me about this, is that we are, by not teaching American history, we are effectively unteaching it. Uh, used to be, when I was started, started out as a teacher 25 years ago in college, you would at least teach the kids traditional narr narratives about American history. Then you would overlay them with Marxist and feminist readings. And the, the, the faculty found out really quickly, when you expose kids to an actual version of American history, somewhat patriotic, somewhat accurate, and then you gave them Marxist and feminist readings of that history that tried to deconstruct it, the college kids, nine out of 10, chose the, the actual stories, right? So they, in the last 15, 20 years, they decided to get rid of teaching kids American history and civics and only give them the Howard Sin socialist view of how wicked our country is. Exactly. Some of the more interesting uh, results, too, just because of Statistics are staggering here. 63% uh, of the respondents had no idea what the term lengths were for our U.S. senators and our representatives. Another 12% of them, only 12%, actually knew the relationship between the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment. And only 15% of them could identify James Madison as being the father of the Constitution. This is the basic information I guess I remember learning back in it was junior high back then but now they don't teach that in junior high they don't teach it in high school and and then as we see they don't teach it in college i remember mentioning mentioning uh, madison as the fa as the uh, father of the constitution and in all this is a couple of years ago in all seriousness i had a kid respond oh james madison is he's the guy is he the guy whose wife makes all those donates donuts and uh, hohos literally asked me that is Madison's wife, the one who makes all those ho hos and cupcakes. Seriously, that was the only real, that was the only way he could tie James Madison to something he knew. Well, we found. I mean, it, it makes sense. Obviously, the way our society is set up and what we actually put our priorities are in college, because we know it's not about learning, reading, math, anything. Only eighteen percent of colleges and universities actually even include in American history or civics course in those gen ed requirements. But you know you're taking race, class, and gender 16 mm -hmm. different times. And that's what's really the dangerous. It's not just that in, when your kids sign up for a history class, they think they're getting American history. What they're getting is radical Marxist professors undercutting and lying about American history. But when they then leave the history class and go take a class in American lit, guess what they're getting? Race, class, and gender overriding the literature. And then when they, they scut scuttle on down the hallway to a sociology class, guess what they're 
forgetting race, class, and gender, Marxist perspectives of sociology. And then when they zip over to the theater department and they think they're going to be acting in a uh, Shakespeare's Julius Caesar for fun, they find out that the director has made Julius Caesar Donald Trump and all the people stabbing him Nancy Pelosi. And so this is what they get again and again and again replicated on their education wherever they're going. And that trickles down into high school classes mm -hmm. and the civics classes, the honors classes even, where we have a story from Wolcott, Connecticut. School officials had to drop an assignment that was designed to determine whether a student is liberal or conservative after objections from both parents and Republican lawmakers. That's how much attention this story drew. So the assignment was being used in a 10th grade honors honors civics class at Wolcott High School and asked students to respond to yes or no to eight different statements. And it included some statements such as, you shouldn't have to attend a religious institution once a week. Yes or no. Uh, the answers to each question was designed to show whether the student had either conservative or liberal views. So you're trying to give a 10th grade student and accurately gauge whether they think them liberal or conservative based off of eight yes or no statements. And, and it's not really a liberal or conservative thing. It's, it's things that would any normal sane person would agree. Should kids be allowed to listen to any music they like, right? Should kids be, things like that. And if you answered yes to those, you're liberal. And if you answered no to those, then you're an evil conservative. So this was not about actual debates about economics or individual rights, the Constitution, the First or Second Amendment. No, 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 no. This was asking kids a bunch of things that 99 times out of 100, even conservative kids, would have said yes to, and then pretending that this means you're really a liberal. So because you've answered yes on these nine stupid questions, go vote liberally, progressively. Yeah, I, the, the simple fact that they had kids should be able to stay out all night after junior there prom. There you go. Well, you prude if you say not, right. not all night, and only till like 2 a.m. instead no, of because 6 a.m. Conservative kids don't like to party. We know that, right? Party, They're wet party. blankets. So again, <sighs> one of the questions, should kids be able to stay out all night long after prom, junior prom? And who's going to say no to that? Right? And so all these kids now who thought they were normal or, or apolitical or maybe even conservative, now because of these nine c c questions, have convinced themselves that they're liberals. And that's, now you're going to have to go vote that way to verify it. Yeah, so State Senator Rob Sampson, a Wolcott Republican and one of the most conservative members of the state legislature, had learned about this assignment because a parent wrote to him and said uh, he noted that the questions didn't cover traditional po political issues such as what you talked about, taxes or spending, highway tolls, death penalty, foreign policy, basically any issue that would maybe even possibly be in the realm of determining if someone's what more liberal are, right. or conservative. Uh, he said, it's a political spectrum test, but the questions have nothing to do with politics. Any 15-year-old, regardless of their home situation, whether they were brought up in a liberal or conservative household, will probably answer yes to those questions. I would probably come out as a liberal on that test. And yes, you would. Why, why have nine questions? Why not just have one for these liberals? One, do you care or not? Just that. And if you answer yes, well, then you're a liberal. Well, all right, we're going to get your liberal voting card ready. Just one question's all you need, right? Well, we've uh, learned that Democratic college students don't care, at least about being American. They're not proud of it. We, uh, it, it. This is not, again, not shocking, but a college poll survey, which was done exclusively for the college fix, uh, asked 1,000 students, are you proud to be an American? How proud are you? Are you very proud, moderately proud, only a little proud, or not proud at all? And they found, unsurprisingly, that... 8% of Democrats are proud. Eight. Eight out of 100 students. Independents, they found at least 30, 30%. 30 and Republicans, 74 out of every 100 students were at least proud. Overall, when they took a look at all the thousand collectively, 29% said they were very proud, 34% moderately, and then it just went down with 23% being a little proud, and 14% of these thousand students are not proud at all all to be an American. Yeah, and so when you think about, generally speaking, at the typical major university, there are going to be more self-identified Democrats than Republicans. That's just the way it is. So that's another thing. You know, you have a relatively small pool of Republic, self-identified Republicans, probably a much larger pool of self-recognized uh, Democrats. And so that makes those numbers even more alarming, right? And it also tells you something else, that not even um, um, overwhelming majorities of Republicans like their country. And I think that has a lot to do with like what we just saw in the previous survey, what these kids have been hit with since they started going to school when they were five years old. Yeah, but we did get some brave students and usually the ones who are 
really proud of something or really disdainful for something will be the ones to make comments on surveys like this. So we had some co student comments that were provided on this survey really saying, yes, I'm proud and really saying no. Uh, someone at UC Riverside says, hell yeah, I'm proud. I hit the jackpot being born in America. I could have been born in a worse country that denies women, gays, trans, basic human rights. What's really remarkable about that is that's obviously somebody who supports progressive ideologies and yet still recognizes that this country protects them in ways that most other countries in the world don't. The one that gets me a little bit is that first one, the university, a student from the University of Houston. I'm glad to be an American, but I'm definitely not proud. On the one hand, I recognize I lucked out. On the other hand, screw you. That yeah. my there, that's much more typically progressive lo logic to me. And of course, you have Clarion University of Pennsylvania, because kids can't write full, complete sentences or thoughts. Proud? Question mark. Not at all? Exclamation point. Ashamed? Question mark. Embarrassed? Question mark. Definitely! Exclamation point. <laughs> that's the whole statement. You're supposed to take what you will from that one. And look at this one from Colorado State. I didn't do a damn thing to be born here, right? So on the one hand, you think this is gonna be a smart kid. Like, I did nothing to earn this, right? I did nothing to, to, humble, to be, to be of, easy. Yeah. You almost think that way. And then he says, or she says, I don't know, I didn't risk my life crossing an ocean in a life raft or trekking across a desert. So this is somebody who you think gets it, right? There are, I'm lucky to be born here. I did nothing to earn it. Think about those people who are risking their lives to come to this great nation. How wonderful it was for, but then the final sentence. I'm not an, an indigenous survivor of six centuries of genocide. I'm not proud of being an American at all. So you acknowledge that you're here by accident, but, y but all these people keep coming here, this big, racist, nasty place. All these people, they're legitimate Americans. If you risk your life to sail across here from, from Cuba in a bathtub, or you cross deserts in, in Mexico to get here, then you're a real American. But to be born here as an American makes you just, I guess, kind of a racist murderer. Anyway, we're going to go to a story about, you know, just down the, the road from us in Madison, Wisconsin, where the Madison Metropolitan School District, they have a zero po tolerance policy about using any racial slurs, okay? So last week, that policy actually was challenged when Marlon Anderson, he's a 48-year-old man who serves as a security assistant or crossing guard as well, for 11 years at Madison West High School. And he stepped in when a black student who was refusing to leave the school grounds decided to push the assistant principal. So Anderson, who is also black, says the student then began to call Anderson the N-word at least 15 times in a just profanity-laced tirade. And Anderson used the slur himself to say, hey, stop calling me the N-word. And Anderson is the one who's fired in this instance. Well, you know, the humor in this is that a zero tolerance policy doesn't mean what progressives say it means. So you got a kid, you so basically a young student going N-word, 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 N-word 15 times. And the black security guard going, don't call me an N-word. At which point the black security guard has to be let go. And you know that kid was not expelled from school. How about this? What if you, because we've now learned, right, that the N-word is horrible unless you're black and you sing it. Yes. Right? Correct. So if you're a rapper, what if you said, I'm a, I'm a gonna be a big turd. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a gonna use the N word. Gonna, 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 gonna make my voice heard. Would that have stopped him from being fired? Please feel free to appropriate that extemporary rap that I just did. I'm a, I'm a gonna be a big turd. I'm a, I'm a gonna use the N word. I'm a, I'm a gonna make my voice heard. Had the security guard just l let go of the chokehold on this violent kid and suddenly started rapping across the stage. Maybe a couple of hoochie dancers came out and twerked it. I'm a, I'm a gonna use the N word. I bet you he wouldn't have been fired. Our expectation when it comes to racial slurs has been very clear. Regardless of context or circumstance, racial slurs are not acceptable in our schools. It's a standard we will continue to hold for professional conduct that has been applied consistently and will continue to be applied Consistently. Then consistently the kid's been expelled, right? No. But I don't think you understand what the word consistently means. Yeah, Anderson actually called the policy lazy. He said you can't eliminate racism by ignoring it, by trying to hide the word or t by trying to legislate the word. What if a white student calls a black student an N-word but doesn't say the word? It's the intent behind what you're or saying. Or if a white kid called a black security guard the N-word 15 times and the black security guard said, how dare you call me the N-word, we would not be having this conversation. 
That would have been justified on the part of the black security guard. So in other words, to be black and a student carries much more weight than to be black and an officer. The story actually went viral and Cher, woo, Cher got involved with it and spoke on Anderson's behalf. A petition was started and then students actually planned a walkout uh, that Friday that included a thousand students, including Anderson's son. And because of all this going on, of course, the school district had to kind of back off, back off on what they did. And now Anderson supposedly has his job back. The union executive director said he'll be getting full pay and benefits when the returns finalized, but it's not finalized yet. So it, it's still and in the And why works. isn't the union screaming bloody hell about this? I mean, I guess they're working on his behalf, but there should be their union voices that will protest anything should be picketing this school, number one. And number two, uh, you know, go, let's just let's take a moment and talk about zero po tolerance policy. When you start from the perspective that you have zero tolerance for something, anything, you have by definition argued that you are unwilling to adapt or take circumstances into account. It is a myopic, stupid, anti-education position that liberals always take, which is why our, ed kids, our kids are coming home, myopic, narrow-minded liberals. And that's why after 35 years, government schools are worse than ever. Tell me about this. Yeah, this story is in The American Thinker. It's by Lawrence M. Ludlow, a, se Ludlow, a semi-retired business writer who taught in Detroit 35 years ago and returned to the classroom because a local high school was unable to replace a Latin teacher who had resigned. They're still teaching Latin in questioned. Detroit schools? Well, that's something. He holds an advanced degree in medieval studies and renewed his own cert certification to teach Latin history and social studies. Once in class, however, he witnessed firsthand the shockingly politicized atmosphere of today's factory-style his words, government monopoly schools. I love that. Factory, factory style, style government monopoly, monopoly schools. schools. There you go. I, was, I wasn't even in school 35 years ago, but just in the time period that I was in school, went away from school, came back, and my eyes were open to how this factory style government monopoly schools, how they're operating now. So when I read this story about uh, Mr. Ludlow, I said, yep, makes sense to me. He said his first exposure to school politics came when he renewed that certification. He said the 1982 certificate listed only the, teach, uh, like the courses he could teach. However, the 2018 version now has a 300-word code of ethics that amounted to a profession of faith in collectivism, egalitarianism, state schools, and diversity. Of course, it's all about color, skin and, color, sex, nothing to do with ideas. But that's not surprising. The race, gender, garbage is everywhere. I'm not surprised by that. But this so-called 300-word code of ethics actually makes, your, makes you pledge your faith to collectivism and state schools. In other words, in order to teach at this school, you almost have to profess to be an enemy to private Christian homeschool and charter schools. He went to an interview, he taught some of these kind of test classes uh, to these first and second year students, and he, he actually managed to get hired. Okay, so now he's in the first few days of classes. He said within those first couple days, it was so evident to him, these kids don't know English grammar. They, pfft, Latin be damned at this point. They don't know any of this stuff. So he had to teach remedial grammar, just outline so that students could pass getting a C or a D. He had to just break it all the way down. And you have this same yeah, thing we happening. We, it's now considered racist and white supremacist to teach your kids in writing classes, grammar, syntax, punctuation, capitalization. Who's to say there's one white standard of correct English, right? Even though English is a white language invented by, wait for it, white English people from Germanic backgrounds, even though Latin and Greek root words, so-called white people, contributed to the English language, still and all, right, the fact that there, white people have decided there's a standard English makes white people white supremacists. So that, uh, that doesn't surprise me. But even in my Shakespeare class, it, teaching Latin's a little bit like teaching Shakespeare, right? Mm -hmm. In the sense that these kids are clueless. And when I find myself trying to talk to these kids about teaching, to reading Shakespeare, you, you sit down and you ask them, why are they have, I've taught sixth graders Shakespeare before. They didn't have a lot of the political baggage but they knew a little bit about grammar so they could pick it up. These college juniors and seniors, you ask them in a you know, seven or eight line passage of Shakespeare to identify the subject and verb, and you find out they can't do it. Right. The idea that they're gonna read Shakespeare, a, a complicated line of poetry, when they can't even identify a subject and verb, ain't gonna happen. It's not, and uh, this poor prep, he says, is only even the tip of the iceberg. He said students don't even bring books to class. They complained about their homework. They expected high grades, and it didn't matter how proficient, or basically they're not proficient at all. Uh, basically, it's exactly what we're seeing, what you see at the college level, what I saw at the high school level. 
all these kids want everything for nothing, and, and, for doing and, nothing. And Ludlow makes a good point. He said, he started asking questions, like I yeah. do, right? And, oh, and try, when you point out to college kids, these are high school kids, yeah. when you point out to college kids that maybe their reading ability is not what they think it is, they don't blame the school, they don't blame their high schools, they don't blame themselves. They know they can't read it, but guess whose fault it is? So, Mine and Shakespeare's, right? Yep. That's right. So he started asking some of these kids about what they knew, and here are some of the things he found out. He found out that Latin, one of the, what, a very useful but difficult subject. Latin in this high school was a dumping ground for students who had already failed another language, usually English. Picking up a few phrases was simply the goal of Latin, right? Uh, many teachers expected little from their students in other classes but awarded high grades. Students were subjected to parental pressure to obtain good grades regardless of how they performed. One department head had been demoted for teaching at a pre-college level and refusing to lower his standards, so they just removed him from the classroom. They actually bumped him upstairs, right? Demoted to something else, I should say. Senior teachers were dropping out of teaching in disgust. Younger teachers had no choice but to accept the situation. He also found out that under parental pressure, the principal was establishing a process to prevent students from having to take more than one test on the same day. And this is what they call college prep in this Detroit high school. Well, for the sake of society, please, please, please take some time this weekend. Go out, read the Constitution. It's a little document. As always, please share this episode and subscribe to the free audio podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, and everywhere else. Just visit drdukeshow.com and subscribe for free. All right, we'll be back again Monday at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. For Freedom Project, I'm Dr. Duke. She's Katie. And thank Dolly Madison. The next time you eat a a ho-ho or a king-dong, thank her for the Constitution. Until next time, stay educated, my friends.